And while you're doing that, I'll introduce our final speaker for the evening. So we've heard a lot about the technology that's going to come down line in the future. To finish the evening, we wanted to bring it down to what's happening on the ground today. And I'm very pleased to introduce Jamie Marshall Roberts, a new farming technology lead from Syngenta, our sponsor for this whole series of, of lectures. Um, Jamie is leading a team that's investigating and developing new technologies across a number of areas, including applications, drones, weather data, and image analysis. And he's going to look at some of the areas that Syngenta is working on now in robotics and automation technology. So, vote on the poll and give a round of applause to Jamie Marshall Roberts. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name's Jamie Marshall Roberts. I work for Syngenta, and I generally believe I have one of the most interesting jobs in the company, because I get to look at shiny things. Um, you know, I'm looking at, um, working with my team, looking at application technology, so looking at uh, drift reduction, nozzles, um, how to get the most out of our products on farm, uh, using conventional sprayers. Think about how that sprayer might look in the future as well, as we look at different technologies, as sprayers change in their, their look and functionality, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in this presentation. I also um, you know, kind of look at uh, imaging, image analysis, satellites, uh, UAVs, and I get quite passionate about this, so if I start droning on, yeah, please stop me. I can't compete with mechanical hose, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay, so before the jokes get any worse, let's progress forward. So it's not necessarily a rosy picture when you look at agriculture, in the next few years, we have quite a few challenges coming our way. If you look at the regulatory industry, you know, what's happening there with our crop protection products, they're becoming harder and harder to register, more and more expensive, and more products are also being removed as you know, the level of detection changes or we find more kind of hurdles around operator exposure. So how can technology help us in this area? How do we need to comp compete with the rest of Europe in Brexit and you know, making sure we can keep that efficient, reliable food chain continuing? So, we're in a space centre, so it seems fitting to have something to do with space in here. So, does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Satellite? Okay, so this specifically is a Sentinel-2 satellite. So, it's an optical satellite. Uh, are many of you guys here, um, it's not very interactive with the guys on the internet, but are many of you guys here using satellites on farm for monitoring? Yeah, so a handful, okay. So, they have some limitations, it has to be said. If it's cloudy, they're not particularly effective, as they rely on the line of sight. However, when they're not cloudy, they can be very useful. If you want to use uh, NDVI data, looking at kind of the biomass of the crop, or NDRE data, which is looking at the chlorophyll of the crop, we can start to look at how much variation we're seeing in that field. Now, if we want to use that for correcting uh, nitrogen applications or looking where crops are looking more healthy or less healthy, we can use this information. And when we combine that information together and we incorporate it with yield mapping here on the right-hand side, we can start to get a far better understanding of what's happening in our fields. The challenge I have is actually it's quite hard to take all this data into one system that gives you some really useful outputs. What do you do with it? Especially if you're based in Scotland and some of the sites we've had uh, for monitoring within some of the trials work we've done and you only get one scan per year because it's too cloudy and the satellite isn't passing at that point in time. And that is a limitation. Now, there are companies like Planet Labs who are throwing up lots of shoebox-sized satellites all the time, and they are increasing the amount of resolution, the amount of hits of satellites passing over your, your farms at any one point in time. But still, it's got a way to go. So another satellite. This is Sentinel-1. Now, this I find quite interesting. Um, so synthetic aperture radar system is incorporated within this, this satellite. So that's cloud-piercing radar. So that enables 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're getting an image of your farm. Now, reliably, I think they'll be passing every three to four days, capturing information, and it's using radar. It looks at the, um, the ground cover um, that's been there, any difference in structure you're seeing. And also, they look like they'll be able to do quite reliable scoping of growth stage as well. So prioritizing, prioritizing what's happening with your crops and where you should be. So it's another tool that becomes available to actually use on farm at the moment, and this should be really more commercially available from this autumn this year. So, yeah, really 
very useful. However, the resolution is still not that high. Now, when we're talking about a 15 meter area here, that's still quite a large chunk of land, looking at 15 meters by 15 meters. Um, and we can do far better than that. And we can look at far more higher resolution imagery. Drones. How many people here have got a drone or blow that? OK, how many of you would say you're using them effectively? <laughs> OK, so that's encouraging. Um, so drones are great, brilliant fun. Um, if you're like my dad, you buy one for Christmas and crash it within about 30 seconds. Um, if you spend a little bit more money, and these aren't that expensive, it has to be said, relatively, compared to a satellite, it's very cheap. Um, so this is a Phantom 3. So this is now a bit outdated, but they are incredibly cheap. And really, for between five and 800 pounds, you can pick one up. The interesting part for me is, you can either fly this and you know, take a nice pretty picture. Uh, this one's of uh, a trial ADAS, if Daniel, if you recognize the, the field. Now, this is great. We can start to see nice visualizations of trials. We can take nice marketing pictures. Um, it all looks very, very pretty. But for me, it's about getting the detail. Now, the first thing I think this does, it enables you to see variation from above. You look at a field from, you know, sat in a tractor cab, you see a little bit more than you are stood at the side of the field, but you put a drone up in the air, you can start to see a lot more. Start looking straight down, you can see a lot more than that. But why don't we start using them a bit more efficiently? Rather than just taking a picture up or flying around the field, looking for variation, why don't we look at starting to use that automation? And, you know, that becomes a very interesting subject to look at. So, an example. Uh, this is Sam. Now, uh, Sam likes to look around his field and make sure he understands what's happening in that field. So he takes his field and he thinks, right, I'm going to start doing some monitoring. So he goes around the field and spends a long time doing plant counts. There are a lot of plant counts in this field. Um, Sam's not a normal person. Um, he works for me. Um, so he's going around and looking at um, a large-scale trial we're carrying out. And this took 13 man hours to do that. So that was me and Sam out in the field in the rain, I might add, for six and a half hours um, doing plant counts. Incredibly precise, though. Lots and lots of detail. That's 13 hours. That's, that's a long time to a lot of plant counts. So how can we start using technology instead to drive this forward? So we can use satellites. We can get you know, within five meter resolution with a satellite, which is, is pretty good. But all this is telling us is the biomass in there. It's not telling us so much around the actual plant counts. Now, satellite imagery can be incredibly accurate in high resolution. You know, the military will be able to read our newspapers for 10 years. Now, I'm not sure you want to pay that uh, level of pricing to be able to read a newspaper from a satellite for monitoring your crops, but we know that satellites can be used for monitoring. However, if we take a relatively cheap solution, and this is a, uh, an automated um, drone system, um, essentially we take that 13 man hour assessment and we turn it into a flight which took 10 and a half minutes. Now, this is usable. This is a, it's a company called Drone Deploy. It's an online cloud-based system. And it, you send your drone up, and it just flies up and down. And you select the altitude. You select um, you know, kind of the, the pixel resolution you want. And it goes off. And you can see this um, field is 11 hectares, and it's 1.3 centimeters per pixel compared to 15 meters by 15 meters, or five by five, depending how much you want to pay. So it becomes useful. The thing I like about this in particular is it's using that kind of tri-band camera, the RGB camera that you get as standard on a Phantom drone. That's relatively cheap. We can spend a lot of money on multispectral drones, but this is, this is usable, and this is actually scalable. So what can it give you? So this is a, um, a picture, it's an author mosaic put together. So 312 pictures taken, um, I think it was 50, 75 meters height, whatever it was flying at, and it stitches them all together. So you look at the whole field, or you can zoom in and look at that 1.3 centimeter pixel and start looking at individual plants. Now that, for me, becomes really very useful for understanding what's happening in my field, and then I can start to think, well, how do I use that? How do I take it forwards? So there's a few things we can do with it. We can look at the, um, look at the picture and see visually with our own eyesight what's happening with it. We can start to look at plant health. Essentially, how green is it? These red bits here, um, they actually built a motorway here and dumped a whole lot of bricks there so that the plants aren't growing too well. Now, because I've been across the field and you've had that human interface in there, 
and you understand what's happening. Now, you will have this in your own land, but actually, from my point of view, it's walking across and understanding what's there and using the technology to record that. We can also do plant counting. Now, this has to be said, you know, kind of the accuracy depends on how much you want to pay for it, really. Um, but that 10 and a half minute um, assessment, using a, a fairly cheaply available plant counting app online, it actually counted 6,094,000 and some of your plants from that 10 and a half minute flight. That is believed to be within 5% accuracy. And I'll take that. That's, that's pretty good. Now, Sam's very good at doing plant counting, but one day he might turn up hungover. You might feel a bit tired by the end of the day. It's not, you know, the humans aren't you know, kind of constant. We get tired after lunch. The drone just carries on going. Might have to change the battery. But, you know, it's, it's relying on that kind of autonomous effect. Um, we can also start to see other features in there as well, just for recording. Now, this is something we all know. We know if our field has got a hill in it. But actually, is that changing what you want to do? If you have a north-facing side of a field, do you want to carry on putting um, as much onto it as a south-facing? Yeah, if it's going to get less sunlight on it in the winter, you know, how do you man manage that rather than doing it holistically across the whole field? If you really want to, you can stick on some virtual reality goggles and look around your field. You know, the 3D models are all produced by these systems. Um, I talked about spending more money. Um, we can spend more money. So this is a, an M100 drone with a Sequoia camera system on it. Um, it's great. Um, you know, we're using this to start understanding far more in detail about what's happening uh, within the trials we're doing, on the farms we're working with. But once again, it is more expensive. And for me, the RGB cameras are, uh, are a bit more scalable. Now, the thing which makes it very interesting for me is this kind of variable rate side. Now, identifying variation in the field can be done pretty easily. The challenge is actually doing something about it. If we take um, herbicides here, if you were to use uh, a leading herbicide, Axial, for instance, how many times are you applying Axial on its own in a tank? You've normally got it in a, uh, a tank mix with various other chemicals in there. You might have some trace elements, and uh, fungicides, insecticides, whatever may be with it. So do you want to change everything in that spray tank by 30% going through it? And, and this is one of the real blockers for me. This is about looking at technology moving forwards and how we can actually work with the, the manufacturers, uh, you know, the ironmongers actually building the sprayers, looking at direct injection um, uh, systems straight into the, uh, the line, closed transfer systems, which can then actually take these products and start to put them on where they need to be. Because I don't want to put the fungicide down by 30% there. You know, there might be some disease coming in. There could be a yellow rust foci developing as well as some wild oats. You know, how do we change that around? And that needs to be far more implemented within agriculture. Now, all these systems can be incredibly complex. So I spoke about the um, your kind of variable rate files and how you produce them using multispectral sensors. Now, this is a system using the Sequoia camera. The Sequoia camera itself and the drone, you're talking probably about 8,500 pounds to buy uh, one of those drones as a, as a basic package. If you want to use a processing system. Um, and we talked about connectivity. So you can do this on your own computer. I wouldn't advise it because you might kill the computer, but you know, a standard computer um, you know, can have this installed onto it. If you want to do it efficiently, you need to spend about £3,500 on a really high-end laptop to be able to process this data. Now, when you're spending 8500 on a drone, 2000 on the stitching software and the analysis software, and then 3500 on, on a laptop, it does get a bit expensive. But there are other options out there. You can go to cloud-based software. If you've got the internet connectivity to upload, um, the gigabytes worth of data. And on a farm, you'll be talking about you know, kind of terabytes worth of data, huge amounts of uh, imagery or uploaded. But we can start to see variation. Here, for instance, this is a spring crop which is only just establishing versus winter crops. We can see that variation. And then using systems to create shape files, we can, we can map it. So here, we're looking at um, establishment. You look at the establishment, and very easily, we can incorporate variable rate applications. Now, you can set this. Now, whether this is for a herbicide or a seed rate, it all depends on what you're looking at at the time. And that's that human interaction, that human interface. What growth stage is the crop at? What do you know about the history of that field? What are you looking at? Because at the moment, the drones do struggle to tell the difference between black grass and a wild oat and a wheat plant. You need to be spending a lot of money on systems to be able to understand that. 
However, with your knowledge, you can look at that area, you can see that variation, and you can decide actually you want a full rate in this area or a half rate somewhere else. And you can plug that into the machines pretty easily. So variable rate drilling, are many of you guys doing that? Okay, so were you amazed how easy it is to do? Yeah, so for me, I, I come across a lot of people who say it's really hard to do. Um, now, I may not be the average person, but I had one of these Trimble Nomads in my office drawer. Which I'm sure everyone does, right? Um, so it took about 10 minutes to get this to talk to this Vardasad control box. Now, that Vardasad drill was um, supplied by a contractor that day. It was built in 2008. It hasn't been modified since then. And then this autumn, we stuck a variable rate give algorithm into it from this Nomad using Farmworks, and it took 10 minutes. The biggest problem was trying to strap that thing to the, uh, to the door. You know, and it just worked. Now, the contractor was really annoyed about this, because for the price I paid him to come and drill that field, he could have set himself up for variable rate. So I think for me, it's, it's having an understanding that actually the technology is out there at the moment. We have some limitations with the sprays, what we can use, and the tank mixes that come within it. But this is really accelerating. And the manufacturers, the ironmongers, um, I'm in a meeting about it tomorrow, looking at how we try and push this on in the, in the industry. Um, OK, so we, we touched on this beforehand. Um, in fact, yourself, um, you touched on this about uh, be, be online of sight. Now, at the moment, we have restrictions of using UAVs and drones, and we should be there in the field. Now, the drone deploy system, you go into the field and you tick a box saying, yep, I'm here, it's safe to fly. Drone takes off by itself, goes off, flies, comes back, and hopefully lands in one piece. Now, at the moment, the only thing stopping the drone operating outside the, the visual line of sight is we don't have an approved uh, detect and avoid system incorporated on drones, which is approved by the CAA. Now, if you look at what Amazon are doing, they're looking at using technology. Now, I'm not quite sure they'll be delivering packages using one of these drones, because it's normally a different kind of package that's delivered with one of these. But all jokes aside, what they're doing is really interesting. They are looking at very efficient drones. They're changing the design of the drones. It's not a quadcopter. It's not a fixed wing. It's a hybrid of the two, and it's delivering packages. And they're doing this. Yeah, they're based in Cambridgeshire. They're out there looking at how they implement this. And I'm, I really believe this will be a, gate open, a gateway for us. Opens it up and... Um, yeah, we get to the stage where we have these little things. Absolutely, I, I completely agree. If you have one of these going out, scouting your farm on a regular basis, you're not um, restricted by satellites. Um, you know, they can go out, scout your fields, come back, download the data, put it into an FMS system, which they then actually understand it. You look at the guys like Google, IBM, some of these massive data companies are looking at the algorithms behind all this information. Someone's going to crack this really soon. So I think we're... Um, you're on with it at the moment. Hmm? You're on you're on with it at the moment. So yeah. Really yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking to those guys very regularly at the moment. They're, um, they're really uh, looking at doing this and they're, they're pushing forwards. The thing I like about them, like I said, is the RGB imagery because it's scalable and cheap. Okay, so I've probably been talking for a bit longer than I should have been uh, by now. But um, yeah, I'd be delighted to take any, any questions anyone has on uh, any of these subjects. <laughs> it's exactly the same as mine. Brilliant. Oh. Um, do you see yourselves having a role translating this technology from the trial scale individual field to the level that you can help farmers roll out across farms soon? I'm already doing it. Yeah, but you're an exception, <laughs> aren't you? This is not accessible yet to your average farm. Mm. I think the technology is accessible. What's not necessarily ac um, accessible at the moment is the, the knowledge transfer. So taking the information and... Um, so if you take, for instance, some of our genetic lines coming through, if we can understand and inform you of the phylicron, so the time it takes for each leaf to, to emerge, if we can give you that information saying, well, actually, look at the phylicron time coming through, therefore you need to be more reactive in this field on this particular variety, I think we can definitely be better at that and start pushing that forwards, and that's something we're definitely... Of looking at understanding more around our genetics and how we push that out. You mentioned uh, the notion of the drones at the moment. Sorry. You mentioned that the drones at the moment are finding it difficult to differentiate black grass from wheat. 
that would be a really, really useful ability uh, if it could differentiate, yeah. particularly when you, you know, black grass is appearing in a patchy fashion, not yeah. in a consistent fashion. So that combination of spotting the patchiness of it and where it's worse mm -hmm. and where you can then pick for your rotations or cultural controls, whatever controls you want to go with, how far off is that or is that available yeah. now? So I think actually, um, I say it's hard to detect between them. I'm talking at the growth stage at the moment, for instance, or at very early post-emergence timing. Actually, in head, black grass looks pretty different from a wheat crop, so you can differentiate between it a bit more easily. So that side of it, actually, using PIX4D, um, you can go and you can essentially select an area which has a patch of black grass, and it will look for all the other same spectrums of light across the rest of the field. So that you can do at the moment. So very just simply, just go out in July when it's going into seed, actually, and pick out the blackgrass yeah. spots in July, get your images there and go back on yeah. that. We know blackgrass is going to spread four or five metres, you know, wind spread, so it's going to move around, machinery, you've got to factor that in. But yeah, absolutely, you can certainly go and see where it is and then react to it in the following year. You don't go with uh, ploughing then, so where you're seeing the no. broom, you don't, you don't have to plough, you still stay with the Claydon, you yeah, just deal with it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah we're doing all this, we're doing all this, I've been, um, just two years I've been doing this by now. Yeah, big into it this time now, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, it's going to be a great, a fantastic, this discussion is going, and I think we want, to, we want to keep it going, so that's fantastic. Can you give a big round of applause to Jamie for his presentation? <laughs> yeah.